And um, I, I want to share with you tonight a little bit more still about the journey that we had been on once I was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. And I, you know, I understand that, you know, we've got Glenn here and, and Peter who have all, all also been diagnosed with that disease. And, and, uh, and I'm sure there are many, as Pastor Paul said, going through their own journey of suffering as well, whatever that might mean in your life. I don't think any of us go through lives without having certain amount of battle scars and uh, battle fatigue because we're dealing in a world that is filled with sin and brokenness. And the Bible says until Jesus comes, we live under this groaning and this moaning of, of the weight of what the world needs to be delivered from. And when Jesus, heaven and eternity, reveals themselves again, we will be free from that. But until then, we do the best we can in the name of Jesus and by his strength. And I want to talk about that journey a little bit with you. Uh, you know, as these two brothers would be able to um, identify with, the day that you were diagnosed with motor neuron disease, which is a disease that kills 80% of its sufferers within the first 27 months. Uh, the neurologist will tell you that there is no known cause and no cure for this disease. They don't want to see you next week or next month. They want to see you maybe in six or seven months because there's literally nothing that they can offer you in terms of a cure or, or to help you through. And, and so that's a day that doesn't matter what colour you've been living with in your life, all the colour disappears on that day. As far as my experience was anyway, I was a pastor of a growing church. We just bought a building, the church was growing and, uh, and flourishing. I was on the state executive of our movement, and so we were you know, looking over 300 churches. I was in charge of church planning for New South Wales. I was on the heads of churches for Newcastle, so meeting with the Catholic, the Anglicans, the Methodists, not the Methodists so much anymore, one of the, the, uh, the symptoms is your mouth can get clogged up with all sorts of stuff. So Glenn's sitting in firing range of my spit. <laughs> 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 it's <a bit> bad. <laughs> and, and, and so my world was filled. I mean, it was literally, you know, things were happening and we were loving life. And then you go to a neurologist and he's told you that you're going to die within 27 months uh, you know that's the the situation that you find yourself in there's nothing we can do suddenly all the color is removed and you're living under a black cloud of gray colors all over not knowing where to go what to look for and how to discover life afresh and anew and certainly to live the best of the life that you have been told you have left I know this is sounding pretty grim and uh, just hang with me, okay? Don't leave right now because if you leave now, you're, you're going to be in a bad night, you know? It's going to be terrible for you. But, you know, I, and I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about how do we get the colour back into our life when something like that saps the colour out of our life? When, when a diagnosis or a broken relationship or the death of a loved one or something happens that you had never anticipated happening, especially now that you're a Christian, if you are a Christian, where you're believing that every good thing, everything's going to happen, it's all going to be good, it's all going to be rosy, and things are going to move so brilliantly through life, and then suddenly something happens that robs you of, of that ability to think beyond the moment that you're living in now and seeing any possibility of finding a way out. And that's literally where it was. It was where at home, no job, no title, no, none of the things that give you a sense of self-worth and security as a man or as a family, as partners together. And so we're sitting at home, no longer preaching in my church, no longer being a part of the, the state exec, all of those things gone within a few weeks of being diagnosed with motor neuron disease. 
So it's not the death of, it's not just the death of your body that you have to deal with, it's the death of your income, your career, your goals, your dreams, your visions, your desires for the future that you're thinking, wow, you know, I'm going to work at this work and we're going to come to a retirement age, we're going to enjoy the grandkids and kick back. Suddenly all of that is turned upside down. The colour is taken out. So how do I get the colour back into a life where the colour has been removed? And how do I get colour that is in a way something that can never ever be removed again? Because most of the colour I realised that was in my life was man-induced colour. It was me getting titles and, and positions and being the person that I believe God had called me to be and, and receiving all of the accolades and, and, and the attention that those things cause. But whatever the world gives you, the world can take away. But if the world doesn't give you something, the world can't take what it doesn't give you away. Especially if what you've received is from God. Nothing the world can do can take away what you receive from God. And so we have to receive something from God when everything the world has to offer is null and void or come to this black and white scenario, I guess. I was traveling through Morocco and my, my, my message comes from 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It says, and now by faith, hope, love, and these three, by the greatest of these is love. So about 25 years ago, I'm traveling through Morocco and coming to the city of Rabat, which is the capital of Morocco. Many people think Casablanca is, but Casablanca is just a romantic city in Morocco. And mind you, it's not that romantic either, let me tell you. I've been there. But we're traveling through Morocco to Rabat, the capital, and we pull into the tea house. They don't have necessary coffee houses or cafes. They have tea houses, and they sell uh, peppermint tea. So we're sitting in the tea house, and I see a painting. And I really liked the painting. I thought, man, that, I, I was just drawn to that painting. And, and I asked the owner of the, of the tea house, could I buy the painting? He goes, no, 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 you can't buy it. Too many uh, painted this and uh, you can't have it. And I go, okay, well, that's fine. On the way back out, I thought, I'm going to try one more time. And this time I'll take 250 US dollars and you know, whip it in front of his nose. Have a smell of this, man. This is US dollars. And so I said to him, I said, what about 250 US dollars? And he said, sold, it's sure. <laughs> I, said, I said, thank you. I'm not sure. Can we put that painting up? Here is a painting that I bought in Morocco in a little tea house. And now the artist to me, he follows me on Facebook. He's a Muslim living in Morocco, but he follows me on Facebook and he loves the fact that I'm talking about his painting and he listens to my messages and reads my blogs and all of that kind of stuff. So after 25 years, there's this connection because of motor neuron disease to an artist that I didn't even know, but I bought his painting 25 years earlier. Now, I think what struck me about this painting is that it took me back to primary school because I, I learned in primary school that there are three primary colours, blue, yellow and red. And if you've got blue, yellow and red, you can create any painting and any masterpiece in all the world. In fact, every masterpiece and painting you see in the world comes from those three colours, blue, yellow and red. They all come from that. If you can start from the primary colours, then you can make tertiary colours and secondary colours. You mix the colours and you can come up with any painting, any artist, any masterpiece has to begin though with these three colours. And so an artist has his palette. And really all he has to do to create whatever he has in his mind and visions in his mind is yellow, red and blue. And so we start with yellow. We, we read about, we, we learned about that in primary school, didn't we? You know, you can remember that was one of the three primary colours. Well, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, faith, uh, love, uh, faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. I want to put to you today that God can bring colour back into your world, but he can't do it unless you provide him with three primary colours. And that is faith, hope and love. And faith is this yellow. Faith is this yellow that every day you have to somehow produce this uh, faith in God where you can put faith on the palette and say, God, 
I'm putting my faith in you. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Greek word is pistis, which is P-I-S-D-I-S. I love to say it because it sounds like you're swearing, but I'm not swearing. It's the Greek, okay? It just gives me... It's like saying, you know, Jesus hung on a bloody cross. You know, you just kind of... You like to be able to say that word now and again. But you give a context. So this is what faith means. Faith means trust and confidence. If you go to the Greek... That is a, the interpretation, that is the literal interpretation of, of faith. It's trust and confidence. That means every day I need to put my faith, my trust and confidence in God. Every day. Where I present God every day with yellow faith. And you go, God, today I trust you. I put my confidence in you. I might not understand the trial that I'm going through, but I trust you in it. I don't understand why I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but God, I trust you. I have confidence in you and I put my faith in you. And so when the darkness comes, when the color has been taken out of my life, I need to once again allow God to create the masterpiece that is me, a unique. And you know, that painting is unique. I, I brought it home and my wife looked at it and go, oh man. It ended up under the bed. <laughs> she didn't like it. I, I loved it. You know, she didn't like it. But recently, because we've got in contact with the artist, I said, how much do you think this is worth now? Now, I know I'm asking the artist how much his work is worth. But, it, but he said, oh, probably between eight and a half thousand to nine thousand dollars. So now it hangs in the lounge room. <laughs> suddenly it's come. Suddenly, isn't that like a woman suddenly has come out from under the bed, no longer, doesn't hang in the garage, oh, that's in the lounge room. Now, and it's not mine, it's hers now. <laughs> it's in the eyes of the beholder, but I, I want to tell you, whatever you're going through right now, God can't do anything with your life unless you present to him faith. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I didn't write that. The Bible says, without faith, that is trust and confidence in Him. No matter what your world is going through, it's impossible to please God. Now, we love to translate that in the, you know, from the Greek to English as, well, it's really hard to please Him, but we could try. You know, but it says, no, it's not really hard, it's impossible. You can't please God today unless you put faith, trust, and confidence in Him. And once you put confidence in God, then God can use that trust that you've placed in Him and begin to create the masterpiece that is you. And you are a masterpiece. You are a one of a kind. You are an original. And we go through these things in life so that God can, in the area of our life, present to the world, a masterpiece that is you and I. When I was a kid, uh, we didn't have Opal cards. Do you have a, who has an Opal card? Who uses their Opal card? Go card. Oh, you have go cards here. Okay. When I was a kid, you'd go to the train station to get from Pendle Hills to Epping in Sydney, and that, that is irrelevant to you, I know, but uh, when I went to school, I had to catch a train. You'd go to the ticket office, and you'd give them your money, and he'd give you a coloured ticket with a date on it. And when you got to the other end of your destination, there would be a guard and attendant standing at the gate waiting for you to present your ticket. If you didn't present the ticket, then it means you didn't pay to get that trip and you'd have to go back to the office and pay again. Well, us school kids thought that there's a lot better things to spend your money on than a train ticket. And we noticed that when an attendant was not there, people screwed up their tickets and threw them on the ground. So we thought, if we could pick up the tickets that didn't get collected, maybe we could use them another day. And so that's what we would do as kids. We would pick up the tickets that were disused or thrown on the ground. We would pick them up, unwrinkle, you know, straighten them out. And, and then we'd sit there with this yesterday's ticket or last week's ticket on our journey. But you know what? We never had the faith and confidence in that ticket like we had in the one that we had purchased. Because this was yesterday's ticket and someone else's ticket that wasn't today's ticket or my ticket. 
And I've discovered something about motor neuron disease. I will never survive this journey on somebody else's faith and confidence in God. I must have faith and confidence in my journey and in my God for my life. And the reality is I can't use yesterday's confidence and trust in God. Today, I need to afresh put my faith and confidence in God. So I picture every day, I picture myself, I sit in my lounge and I see myself just saying, God, I trust you today. I don't know what today is going to bring. I don't know what weakness is going to come in my body. I know today is going to be the best day that I'm going to have because tomorrow is only going to be weaker and weaker unless, of course, I get a miracle. But if I don't, then my body will progressively get weaker. But God, no matter what that means,